So in this video, I'm going to try to cover the concept of how does the internet work from a web development perspective? What do you need to know about how the internet works? And what I'm going to be covering in this is really stuff that took, I'd say it took me at least five years, if not more, to kind of figure out along the way, because you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what to Google for. It'd be easy to learn if you knew what to Google for, uh, but it takes five or sometimes 10 or more years. Some people never pick up on stuff just because you're not exposed to it. You don't know. And so I'm going to kind of compile years worth of stuff and hopefully make it all really simple for you. How does the internet work from a web development point of view? This video is going to focus mostly on what the front end guys need to know and it's going to cover just minimal knowledge about servers and the next video is really going to cover server configurations. That's really a kind of scary world to people that have lived in HTML, CSS, JavaScript and it doesn't have to be scary. It's really simple. It can be a million things just like the front end can and so hopefully we'll just kind of cover some basic configurations and give you a peek into what that server world is like. Uh, for those of you who want to learn in that direction. So let's get into it. Front end point of view. At, at, the, at the bottom level, at the end of the day, really what the internet is, is your browser, your machine, is making a request to a server and it's getting responses back. The server is just another machine on the internet. It's just another machine connected to the internet. And kind of the browser can be your iPhone, it can be Chrome, whatever. And so that server is a machine. Uh, and whenever a machine connects to the internet, it gets what's called an IP address. Um, some, tons of you guys probably know lots of these things, so if your intelligence gets insulted, just keep with me. We're going to cover a lot of depth here. Uh, but when you plug into the internet, when you connect, you get an IP address. Um, so a server is a box with an IP address. Um, the reason your computer's not a server is you have an IP address. If you go to Google and type what's my IP address, it's going to show you your IP address. You have it right now. So if anyone types in your IP address, it can access your computer just like a server, but you don't have server software running and installed. Uh, we'll get into that in the next video. But if uh, you type in, say, mysite.com, it doesn't know your server's IP address. So what that's going to do is your internet service provider charter, say, is going to do a DNS lookup, a domain name service lookup. It's going to say, hey, mysite.com, what IP address is that configured? Ah, that's configured to this guy right here. Well, let's send you to that box. So your request for mysite.com goes to this box. Um, so say google.com, your ISP takes that and it routes you to whatever IP address google.com has configured. And they probably have thousands of servers and stuff running, which I'll cover a little bit of that in the next video as well. So you connect to the server, it gives you a response. That's the internet. You get requests, you make requests, you get responses. So when I request a site, mysite.com, I expect I'm going to get back. Um, the browser doesn't know what it's going to get back. I'm saying mysite.com as a as a piece of text, I could get back an image, I could get a CSS style sheet, I could get back an HTML file, I can get back anything. The server can give me anything it wants. My browser knows what it's giving me by the content type. So I'm going to get a response back that is both the file and the content type. So when I say mysite.com, server gives me the index.html file and it sets a content type of text slash HTML. Now my browser knows what to do with it. Ah, let's treat it like HTML. And so it begins parsing your HTML document. Uh, what that parsing process, process looks like, uh, for the most part, it goes head to toe, start to finish, um, and it pauses when it finds a request for an asset. An asset is another request that we have to make, like it's another file we need. So that'd be a CSS file would be an asset, an image would be an asset, a JavaScript file would be an asset, so we're going through dot 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 HTML head. Ah, oh, we need another asset, a CSS file. So let's tell our browser, go give me a request for main.css. Does that request? The server rep replies with that CSS file, sets the content type to text slash CSS. Now we know that that's a CSS file and it keeps going through. And now anything that appears, it will consult that style sheet before presenting it to make sure it comes out styled correctly. One of the reasons we put the styles in the header is because if we were to put the style here, you'd get what's called an FOUC, flash of unstyled content. I don't know if you've ever loaded a, a cheaply made web page and you see it flash really ugly real quick and then flicker to beautiful. What that is, is it's loading your, your body 
it's loading through your H1s and your tags and your paragraphs and your divs, and then it's loading your CSS after the fact. So it goes top to bottom. It's already spitting this out for the user to see, and then it pauses. Up, oh, let's get the style sheet. Get the style sheet. Did it? It all happens in a couple milliseconds, and then that style sheet gets applied. That's why we put the style sheets up front. We do want to load those before we start presenting the user with information. Now the reason, we used to put our scripts up in the head too, some people still do, uh, but you can for in almost all cases put your scripts at the footer uh, before the last body tag, before the closing body tag. And what that's going to do is that's going to start presenting your page to the user and then it's going to load your scripts uh, and activate the thing. So you'll see your content slider. Uh, and then it will load the jQuery to make it start sliding, which is totally acceptable. Your user is going to feel like the web page is loading a lot faster uh, than it really is. Another wise thing is you want to concatenate. You want to add all your scripts files together as much as possible. So instead of loading 10 different JavaScript files, it's really going to speed things up if you can put those all into one JavaScript file and then you only have to make one request, talk to the server one time, give me scripts.js, that gets added in and now you've not made near as many requests. You've not paused your page near as often. Same thing with CSS files. Uh, it, keep them broken up while you're developing, uh, but then when you deploy to production, you want to concatenate them all together, put them all together into one file. So then your browser starts loading the HTML, HTML says, oh, give me this one CSS file. Boom, got our one CSS file. We can move on, get our one JavaScript file. We're done. And there are use cases where you need to make more than one. But for the most part, that's really going to speed up your page a lot. And also, if these are minified, uh, if these are minified, which if you don't know what minified is, just look up, you know, what is a minified CSS file, minified JavaScript file. It's a way that you can actually get those files even smaller and even faster. So that's kind of the whole asset, um, the whole page rendering. That's kind of the front end of things. The other way you can make asset requests is through JavaScript. JavaScript can do what's called an XHR uh, request or an AJAX request, they're often called. And so JavaScript can say, you know, real time when you click on a link, JavaScript doesn't take you anywhere. Instead, it says, ah, let's go make a request for the most recent five tweets. That response comes back, and instead of going to the HTML page, it goes into JavaScript, and JavaScript does something smart with those. JavaScript can also make requests for images. It can make requests for CSS files. It can make requests for pretty much anything. Because uh, after all, a request is just a request to the server. The server determines what you get back by its content type. So that's kind of the browser world of things. Uh, before I close out this video, let's look at some sample requests. Let's look at what's going on. Um, and so a request contains two things. It contains headers, and it may or may not contain a post body. So let's look at when I request, I loaded Google.com here, Google.com. Uh, so my first request, if you um, open your developer console and go to network and refresh your page, I can see right here my first request was www.google.com. Let's look at these headers real quick. They're called headers. So I requested google.com. It was a get request. This is the method. And then there's no path to it. I didn't go google.com slash blah, 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 slash blah, blah, blah. I just went google.com. So that's host, method, path. Um, and then I also passed my cookies. I don't really have time to get into cookies in this, but cookies is one giant long string, and that's information that the website has stored on your machine. So as you can see, Google stores a lot of cookies. Um, and the user agent string, this is information about my web browser. So my browser, as you can see right here, is Chrome 37, uh, and that's what the user agent string is. So there's my request, and I did not pass a body. I just want this page. Now, if I was doing a login, Say I had sent my username and password, uh, the method would be a post, and I would have a post body that sent in the username and the password. Uh, so here's kind of requests will include these headers, the host, the method, that's either get post, put, or delete, uh, the path, which is say google.com slash images slash logo.jpg, cookies, user agent, and the content type as well if I'm including a post body. So right here, my post body is a JSON post. And so in that case, my post, my content type would be application slash JSON. So that's a request. Responses also have headers and a response body. So let's look again at that Google. 
if I scroll down here, my response headers, it said my content type is text slash HTML. And it said, let's see, we're going to get a content. We're going to get basically the two headers that are important to you if you're learning, the content type and the status, your status code. Um, so here I got a status of 200. That means OK. And I got a content type of text slash HTML. My response itself, hey, look, it's an HTML page. So I said, give me Google.com. It gave me the HTML page for Google.com. And it said the content type is text HTML. Status is 200 OK. Status doesn't really matter if you're doing HTML stuff. Status matters a lot if you're doing JavaScript stuff. So the status code, we can give you a status. Of anything in the 200s means it's OK. Anything in the 300s means you got redirected. Anything in the 400s means there was an error or the, it's not found or you're not logged in, so you can't access it. Anything in the 500s says the server broke. It blew up. You either gave it something it wasn't expecting or there's a problem on their end. That's what a 500 error, level error is. So that's kind of what a status code is. JavaScript will look for that. Sometimes JavaScript will make a request and a 400, a 404, a 403, those are all considered errors. A 500 is considered an error. So JavaScript will say that wasn't successful. And so that's kind of requests and responses. You'll get a response body. Let's look at some more requests here. The next request we made was google.com. Let's google.com and the path was images proper logo. So I am looking for a PNG and then my response here is the content type is image PNG and the response was well they can't really show you because it was an image. So they sent me an image and with a 200 okay yep we accepted your request here's that image content type blah blah blah. So that's kind of how that works. We then requested a, well, that's a data. That's from the CSS file. We requested some other stuff. Here's another get request. And this was a text JavaScript file that we were requesting. So the response is JavaScript. And it replied with text JavaScript and further on and further on. And that's just how that goes. So there's all the requests that I made just to load Google.com. A lot of stuff going on. Let's look at a couple sample requests in writing, and then we'll be done with this video. We'll move on to the back end, the server stuff. So you make a home page request to Google.com. You're going to do a get request. I probably haven't covered it yet. I'll, I'll give you a brief demonstration. My jQuery tutorial covers a lot of what the different methods are. Get just says, give me a resource. I'm not passing anything with that, usually. Um, a get request, a post request is for when you're usually creating something new or when you're doing something basic like a login. Uh, so let's say I'm logging to Twitter, that's going to be a post request. Let's say I create a new tweet, that's going to be a post request. I'm sending a post and I'm passing it the information of my tweet and any mentions. A put request is when you want to edit something. If I edit a tweet, uh, so let's say if I did a post real quick, I would post uh, tweets slash, I don't know, my tweet ID would be something huge like that. I would do a post to that, and I would have a post body of the new tweet content. Oh, actually, if I'm if I'm posting to tweets, if I'm doing a post, I'm doing a new tweet. So I'll either post to tweets or I'll post to tweet slash new, and then the server knows that if I'm posting to that, that's a new one. If I'm doing a put request, I'll have the ID of what I'm editing. So if I'm doing a put request, I'm putting to this ID, that was the new ID of the new post I just made, and it's going to update that with what's going on. And then there's also a delete request. So if I do a delete method to this path, it will probably delete that tweet. So on Twitter, if you click delete, JavaScript is sending off a delete request to that tweet ID, and it will go away. So that's kind of what those methods are. Get something, create something, update something, delete something. Um, and so that's what your method is. Uh, the path, uh, we already covered path. Path is the path. There's your user agent. The back end will sometimes, if you have a massive website, sometimes the back end will look at this and say, ah, oh, they're on an iPhone, they're on a mobile device. Let's send them to a completely different website that's just for mobile. Uh, and so that's kind of why that user agent is important. And then here's a sample post request. Say I was doing a login, I would do a post method to slash login. My content type would be application JSON, and my request body would be you know a JSON object. Username this, password this. My response would be 200, okay. And if I did a, say this is a JavaScript thing, 
um, and it was expecting a JavaScript response, then it would give me a response that was probably JSON. My response body would say, hey, here's your full profile, Magic Man 11. And then uh, the content type would be application JSON for that. So that's kind of requests. That's kind of your whole front end world of thing, things. In the next video, we're going to really cover the server world and how the internet works from the server side of things. And that's going to be really fun, especially if, if you're completely clueless as to what the server world looks like. I'll leave you for now. Have a great day.